kind of like a bet, a scientific bet. It was really along the lines of um, Ashley saying, look, I bet, I bet the microbes have got something to do with this. And me saying, I work on the nervous system, it's just the neurons. And so we came together with a bit of a test to see whether there was in fact something uh, happening in the microbial population and, and there was, and that was probably about six years ago. Yeah, it was a, it was a nice one where, because Elisa had the mice and she had experiments going anyway, so it was easy to collect faeces. Analyzing microbial communities was our bread and butter, so we could just actually tag on the end of some soil samples. That big one was seeing there's such a clear difference at five weeks of age. And for us, I was like, okay, there is actually something here, you know. Those two mice were in a cages together, they were doing everything together, they lived their lives together and they only had one point mutation, but there was a clear defer- definition or just clear um, separation of their microbiome. And then for us, it's like, okay, this is not trying to use stats to see a bit of a fuzzy, you know, you don't have to squint your eyes at this. This, mm-hmm. this was a clear, clear difference there. My research group and I are really interested in understanding how neurons communicate. And we're interested in this region here, the synapse, the joining point between neurons, where there are thousands of proteins. And these proteins are acting like the Velcro of the nervous system, keeping the neurons in close contact. So we want to understand how this works in normal situations, not just in the brain, but in disease and in the second brain in the gut. It's actually a really um, well-established concept. And I'd have to say that some of the researchers in Australia are the pioneers in this area. And so there's some great research being done right here in Melbourne by people like Professor John Furness and Professor Joel Bornstein, who really first mapped out the neurons in terms of their function and their neurochemicals. What I think is new is this idea um, that we might change the brain in certain disorders and that might also have an effect on the gut. That's a new concept. So most of you will be familiar with this type of nervous system where you chop open a bit of brain and you can see these beautifully arranged neurons stained here for different fluorescent labels in the cerebral cortex. But you might not be so familiar with this one. And this is the enteric nervous system of the gastrointestinal tract. And it looks really different. You can see that the neurons are arranged in a mesh-like arrangement. And these are plexuses and there's two of them. They go all the way along the gut tube in between layers of muscle. Now, many of the neurochemicals that are found in the gut are are the same as the ones found in the brain. And we also know that there are genes expressed in the brain. Most of the genes expressed in the brain are expressed in the gut as well. So we work on the gut-brain axis. We're really interested in understanding how this brain talks to this brain and vice versa. But what we're noticing is that with a lot of these neurological disorders, you think about what you've read about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and and a whole host of other disorders, we're finding there are gut symptoms Uh, popping up in these disorders as well. I think only recently too with a lot of the modern techniques that we have can we really go through and sort of understand this as a a really such a small level because I suppose with enteric nervous system it's being a mesh but then having things like patch clamping or having things like single cell sequencing you know or the DNA technology so you can go through and look at the action of an individual neuron or what's occurring it's not you had you didn't have to mush everything up and sort of get an average you can actually go through and, and do that precise individual genes, complete genomes, human genomes, being mouse genomes have all been sequenced, so then you can map back all your RNA, you can map back all your proteins, and you can look at all these pathways and those very complex interactions. So I think yeah, people have known about it for a long time, but with the ability to get really into it, it's only quite, quite, no, quite, quite new. So we think studying these kind of things are going to be useful for a whole host of neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder or just autism? What we're discovering with autism is that it is actually groups of mutations. So autism as we see it or have been sort of diagnosing is is due to the actions of the individual. We look for these outcomes of it, which could be caused by a number of different mutations. So in the future, I think autism is going to then be subdivided into different classes based on different, different mutations. Although we don't have a simple test for autism, it's, it's diagnosed behaviorally, there's a huge impact of genetics. We know now there's over a thousand gene mutations um, associated with autism in patients. The problem is these mutations are rare, so you don't get very many people with autism with the same mutation, so it's difficult to study. But what we can do is group those mutations based on what they do. And there's a whole bunch of them, nearly 200 or so, that are actually involved in our favorite part of the nervous system, the synapse. 
Even the concept that, um, that genetics are involved in autism is relatively recent. So you will remember that up until I think the 1970s, it was thought to be um, a psychological or behavioural based disorder, and that was due to um, incorrect parenting, if you like. That's not the case. That's absolutely not the case. So it's really been a breakthrough looking at the genetic influence. So where we are now, we have great techniques, but we still don't have all the information. We can scan for panels of um, copy number variations. Do you have too much of a gene? Do you have too little? We can scan for panels of known uh, SNPs or single nucleide um, polymorph polymorphisms, but it's not enough because we're not capturing all the information yet. So the simple answer is no, we can't do a simple genetic test, but we do have a lot more information about genetics than we used to. Now I want to show you what we've been doing in the mouse gut. So I want you to just focus on this right panel. This is a mouse colon that's just freshly been dissected and you pop it into this warm saline and just tie the ends of it to a tube and you see these beautiful, spontaneous and regular contractions starting from the oral end, proceeding down to the distal end of the colon. And you see this content in here? Guess what it is? Microbes. And you'll see a bit of it flush back here and you're getting some relaxation up this end as well. It's a fantastic assay for us. We know that it's regulated by the nervous system. We can add drugs to block the neuron activity and those contractions stop. We can also add drugs that modify neurons and the patterns change. Elsewhere in the gut, you see these really bizarre complex patterns and this is what the small intestine is doing, mixing up our food and digesting and so on. So we're finding ways to analyse and quantify this kind of activity as well. I think what, where we'd like to go um, is seeing how we can modify behaviour by targeting in a very clever way uh, components of the microbial population and that's what we'd like to go forward and look at yep. as well. I think also on the other side is building a catalogue or a, a, a view across different disorders. Are we seeing the same thing in models of different diseases, of neurological disorders in terms of the gut function and the microbial changes? Or are we seeing different things? And I think that's a really exciting thing to do as well. We have the tools to be able to compare across a whole range of things, and that might have implications for the clinic. So we know that gut changes are common in autism, and we know that many genes associated with autism affect neuronal wiring in the brain, and so we therefore propose that it's also affecting neuronal wiring in the gut. And we've shown you that our autism mice have altered contractions in the gut. They have more neurons in some parts of the gut, and we think they've got what you might say is a leaky gut phenotype in some regions. The work that we're doing could um, assist in those more emerging fields. Depression mm -hmm. would be very much linked as well. Um, anxiety. Maybe even something uh, like chronic fatigue. We're, we're looking, you know, at that kind of thing. And then even just then back to the general population is like individuals dealing with situations of stress. Even through general ebbs and lows and stuff in people's general lives, they're not sick or have a, dessert, have a thing, but how does the microbiome respond and how could you actually then help that with the general population health? That sort of comes into personalised medicine yeah. as well, which is another area that's really of interest. And then part of this too is when you're seeing a doctor, is that part of your recovery or part of your health could be looking at your microbiome and its changes over a long term. With the techniques that are available now, we've also got the opportunity to go back and really characterise the different cell types that are in the gut as well. And that can give us more information about what's going wrong in these kinds of disorders. And it hasn't been done, and that's somewhere we'd really like to go as well. We can see that the actual point mutation in the brain, so one base pair in the whole genome, will end up causing differences in aggression and repetition. But this lead to gut um, dismobility, permeability, there's differences in neurodevelopment, differences in the microbiome feeding back, you get the dysbiosis, and there's actually a, a feedback mechanism back and forth. So if you can actually go through and improve that, if you can reduce the aggression or the repetition through the modulation of the microbiome in this gut, it's not a cure, but it increases the quality of life for a lot of people associated with those type of studies. Your microbiome is an incredibly complex ecosystem but we do have opportunities to go through and influence that for, for benefit for individuals. Mutations in genes that affect the wiring in the brain are also likely to affect the wiring in the enteric nervous system of the gut, our second brain.